On the trail, my name is Mythander. Myth for short. Ever since I was small, I've had an itch for exploration. I think it's this need to venture into something new that led me to break from my comfort zone and try DMT. What I found was like nothing else I will ever experience again and will forever cement my physical need for perspective. We each took turns. One person laying down to take in the valley view with a wireless speaker near the ear playing whatever track they wanted for their journey. To this day, I still don't remember what I originally picked. When it was my turn, I got one final instruction and did exactly so. I leaned back, my back feeling the rounded stones of the natural rock recliner we'd been using. I closed my eyes. I exhaled, slowly. Everything became so slow and still. The leaves on the branches of the tree disconnected from their stems and floated next to their branches, no longer attached. I blinked. At least, I think that I blinked. I looked out to the valley of trees and smoothed mountain faces. The mountain in front of me transformed into an oil painting, churning colors, painting and repainting itself over and over again. The trees of the valley below becoming one-dimensional. The sky turning a pink hue with gold hieroglyphs falling through the sky the same speed as falling stars. The strangest part of the whole thing was how every action felt involuntary. There was this presence, guiding where I looked, its fingers turning my neck to take everything in. The trees became simplified, smooth, geometric shapes, like crude models used in a sculpture studio. Then suddenly, the song I'd chosen had gone to the next track. What played was a famous jazz rendition of Old Tenenbaum. I had been looking at the trees again when it began to play. And I was suddenly so overcome by laughter that I slowly came to wake up. And I woke up laughing. The hardest laugh I'd ever laughed. The kind that your gut screams for you to stop. I, I feel like I had been born again. Tears streaming down my face and stinging my eyes. What I had just seen slowly fleeting away from my brain like a dream. It's only after thinking back on it thousands of times, years later, that I'm able to recall everything. It was a view that I cannot explain. It was something trying to get a message across, guiding me, showing me these beautiful things. Thinking back, I can still feel its presence and what it or even they were trying to show me. Even now, it's still digesting in me. It's still left an impact. It's given me a view I can never see the same way again. I find myself strikingly okay with it. If I saw something that beautiful, shouldn't I want to see it again just a little bit? All right, so we're uh, flipping that mic today. Flip, flip, flip! Flipping that mic. Uh, so this, uh, it, all this talk about drugs and uh, things, obviously this must all be our second Olivia drugs. episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. For regular listeners, uh, you will have noted that uh, Olivia is taking control today. I didn't know where you're going with that, but I thought it was gonna be something about I've noted Olivia on drugs. Like I thought it was gonna be like I don't know. If you've been listening, you notice Olivia's on drugs ninety percent of the time. I think just the last episode you talked about not being on drugs. We all confessed to not being on drugs. I That's assume exactly I what did. someone on yeah. drugs would say. <laughs> I assume everybody's on drugs until they tell me otherwise. So if this is your first episode with us, normally I I am your your uh, research host, but today Olivia has done the work on what's our topic again? Uh, DMT and machine elves. Machine Woo! elves. So very exciting stuff. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I have to introduce us yes. now, because I'm Rob. Hi, yes. I'm Rob. No, I'm actually, I'm Olivia. You introduce yourself first, right? Yeah. I like how you made the correction, though. <laughs> You're like, no, actually, I'm Olivia. <laughs> and Just then I asked you by... People yeah. forgot. Yep. I, I'm Olivia. I'm a grandmaster, but today I am... In charge. You're still Grandmaster. But in charge, Grandmaster. That's true. I'll give you that. The master in charge. <laughs> I, I'm our oh. master. So uh, oh, since you're ooh. in charge, you're going to have to tell us who else is sitting around the circle. Yeah. We got Shannon Landers. Howdy. I guess I don't have to say your last name. Did we do that you here? Just we do that yeah. sometimes, yeah. So, okay. Well, I like, yeah. yeah. Jacob Wheatley. <laughs> what are their titles, oh. Grandmaster? Oh. Inquisitor. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be a long episode. Isn't wrong it? This Guys, all I know is DMT right now. <laughs> our Instaquisitor. Uh, yeah. And then our um, Knight of the Dangling Serpent. Is that your name? I, yeah. Yep. I mean, my name's Jacob, but that well, is my title. Today, it's that's what it is, because I said so. And I'm in charge. Awesome. Oh, and then this guy over here just walked in. 
just walked in. And it's just this homeless man just <laughs> sitting in our circle. My name is Rob Thompson. I am your supreme hierophant of the secret order of alchemical actors. And this is DMT and Machine Elves. Hmm. We the members oh, of the secret, secret order, order of alchemical, alchemical actors, actors do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. All right, Olivia. Plug, plug, plug. It's supposed to be fun and joyous. Yeah, I think oh. we should have them redo it. I was just reading my yeah. lines. Oh, yeah, put it's my line. So it's written on the paper here. Plug, plug, plug. Oh, oh that, that was, was yeah, that, that was, was pretty yeah. close. It was, it was quick. <laughs> Good, because I don't think our listeners want to hear that again. Okay. Well, <laughs> debatable. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you plugging? <laughs> we got some sources here. Delightful. What are, what are we using? Because I didn't make this all up, mm -hmm. even though it sounds like it. Um, so I mostly, I did a lot of combination of things, but I, I covered a lot of Terrence McKenna work. I mostly, I took a lot of quotes of his from like the Archaic Revival. That's one that I use probably the most. But I used like a lot of his interviews all over the place, and you can find them in all of his books. I used um, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. I used the, there's both a novel and then there's also a documentary oh. out there. Ooh. So I, some of you might have actually, it used on to Netflix, be on Netflix. Right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's not, not anymore, there. but okay. you can actually find it on YouTube now. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. That's handy. Um, and then another actual, um, another documentary that I watched, which is interesting and it offered me a lot of perspective and it's something worth watching, is The Last Shaman. That's also on Netflix and it's really, really interesting and it follows, um, the journey of a guy to basically through his depression to a shaman to see what's up so yeah. very cool um and then a lot of deep diving on reddit honestly looking at people's <laughs> uh retellings of their experiences on dmt yeah reddit is a big part of the dmt machino universe yeah a lot of people go on there to like collect instances of common occurrences so, so. Uh, bless you for sifting that Yep. <laughs> so, How are you feeling after that I'm deep a, dive? I'm a little, I'm a little bit rough right now. Um, but you know what? It's fine because the machine elves are gonna tell me what's up. Let's give uh, give a, a shout out and a word of thanks to Wald Trom. That's a. I have mm. to think about that for a second. <laughs> uh, so that's Wald is our friend on Instagram. And he has also very recently joined our patron family. family Welcome patrons. to the family. Family. So uh, just a, a little bit of a teaser here. To, do you have any more plugs? No, I'm ready to tease. Oh. Tease. Uh, a little bit of a teaser, I guess, is our last plug while we're still on the subject of, of Patreon. First of all, Church Secrets is a terrible podcast and no one should listen to it. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Jacob is not all caught up on his cult confessions. <laughs> yeah, we're shit talking other podcasts. I well, I I, I picked up that. It right, is our rival podcast. This that is our we rival. Have created to make Instagram drama. Yeah, it doesn't exist. We made it up. It's the yeah, opposite yeah, yeah. of occult confessions, church secrets. We're making up our own conspiracy you see? theories. Yep. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we think we're funny. But but see, yeah, well we'll find out on the reviews. No, so we still think we are. <laughs> really won't change how we feel no. so uh, back to patreon our plan and we still haven't arrived at exactly how we're going to approach this yet but our plan going forward for the second half of our podcasting year is to create an original series that will only be posted to patreon so we've got to come up with a topic and and what have you so if you're out there in the patreon universe by all means drop us a line let us know what you'd like to see or if, if we can tempt you over to patreon let us know what topics might get you to make that pledge. Come on yeah. over. <laughs> yep, we can't. can't well, for like 13 seconds. You okay. can, yeah, you can do it. Come on soon. over. Mm, that's actually mm, 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 our Patreon. Mm. It's the same episodes, but Olivia and Jacob sing. They sing the whole yeah, song. They sing the yeah, whole thing. Sure. Ooh, I don't know if that's, that's okay. like yeah. still the feels scandalous. Scandalous. Yeah. We don't actually do that for everyone oh. who works for ASCAP. When I start my own podcast, that's all. <laughs> Church secrets? <laughs> Did we already do that? You just ASMR'd that. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's do the whole episode in ASMR. Uh. Patreon. All right. On today's flipped episode of Occult Confessions, we're going to be talking about machine elves, also known as fractal entities, commonly experienced when on DMT. 
I'm gonna break down the episode into two parts. So we're gonna break down exactly what DMT is and then what it does in your body before we go on to like the actual technical what's a machine elf. While less known as a topic overall, I think today's episode is gonna be maybe a little bit easier to sit with on the reptilians, but... <laughs> easier to buy? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I might get you a little bit here, especially I mean, we're, Rob. We're in the podcast universe. So we do have to know that Joe Rogan, king of all podcasts, yeah. is a McKenna fan, and mm-hmm. I, I don't know how he gets to the machine elves, but he's, he's all about this stuff. Yeah. yeah, he's big into DMT. Well... You know, anyway. (laughs) So, lesser known topic, but still pretty pretty popular. My friend Myth at the beginning that I was actually reading the story for... His name's um, not actually Myth. No. Names change to protect the innocent. Yes, that's his trail name. So that's the name he Ah. used on the trail. So that's what we went with. The Hmm. psychic trail? Uh, more like... The Appalachian Trail? No, um, yo, 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 Sam, yo. Yosemite? <laughs> yes. Yosemite, yes. okay, all right, got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so my friend, he didn't directly see a machine elf, uh, but he experienced a re-rendering of the reality around him and felt that guiding presence. So like when I say a re-rendering of reality, I kind of mean the weird geometric shapes and the one-dimensional things and the simplifying and the bright colors and that kind of stuff that he was describing. Yeah, I have a friend that I was talking to before this episode, Mm -hmm. and he said that he's actually, from what he understood, was one of the machine elves. He says, like, but he only saw them once, Mm -hmm. but usually the other times when he does it, he sees a lot Aztec-type shapes. Mm Mm-hmm. We'll talk about it in a little bit, actually, but you have to do a considerable amount of DMT to actually go to the point of breaking through and actually experiencing this, like, loss of ego. Because he smoked the DMT, his trip was kind of like a whirlwind of probably only five minutes, even though it probably felt like 30, making it really difficult to have a trip where you experience that loss of ego, like I was saying, and are shown the secrets of the world. Before we go any further, I'm going to go ahead and do a little last minute plug. And I'm going to plug the last episode of the season that we're in right now. The shamans. Yeah. So Rob breaks down traditional shamanism from the perspective of a couple different cultures. And it's delightful. So well, thank you. <laughs> so, so sweet. I'm not going to go into the technicalities and the details of shamanism itself. You can pop on over to that episode. Just relate it over to our DMT. Mm-hmm. Okay. But scientists like Terence McKenna, who we're going to talk about predominantly, studied for years with different shamans himself, believing in reclaiming the medicinal value of psychedelics like DMT or psilocybin. Ah. Which is, do we know? No. No. Mushrooms. <laughs> oh, okay. Mushrooms. Oh, Tripping shrooms. Oh, I kind of just I said mean, mushrooms. Yeah. And... Well, fancy science. You better get used to the science because it's coming. (laughs) We're we're ready. Bring us some science. Well, in shamanistic fashion, McKenna believes that DMT is a way of plants communicating their symbiotic relationship with humans, other life forms showing us the logos, revealing the secrets of death and rebirth, and overall telling us that it's going to be okay to die. Logos, we mean like the voice of God? Yeah. Delightful. The, the knowledge like of all. To us. Yeah, that DMT is basically a way for us to go to this realm of being able to communicate with this entity that gives us the secrets of Whoa. everything. That makes it so that we're not so scared. So we're breaking down the boundary between us and the natural world. Mm-hmm. <gasps> but also kind of reuniting us. Oh. From our... That sounds beautiful. Yeah. Well, McKenna also claims that uh, shrooms originated possibly in space, but you know, don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna get wait, there. Wait, oh. they came from outer space. Okay, teaser. Maybe. Yep. Well, but first, we, we can wait, Jacob. We can wait. <laughs> I'd buy it. I can't. But... We gotta make sure that she comes back to this. Though. Okay. Oh, I will. I okay. Will it's space. it's my favorite. One of my favorite McKenna things, next to the stoned ape theory. <laughs> Which we will also oh, get to. Boy. So many teasers. <laughs> I'm gonna have to keep notes. <laughs> Here we go. Teasing ya. So part one is DMT. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so we're gonna break down DMT. I might butcher some some science words here, and I might not always say things in the most scientific way. Apologies but I, to uh-huh. any chemists out there. But I promise you, I got it up here. Okay. It's all swirling around. Olivia's pointing to her head in case any of you wondered. <laughs> not uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so DMT, 
uh, more scientifically known as demet demet no 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 tryptamine tryptamine tryptamethyl you don't know how many times I've heard them pronounce this in documentaries mm. and I still can't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> It's a chemical substance that's occurring natural naturally within many plants and animals. So you always, I feel like people hear DMT as, oh, it's released when you die. I feel like that's what people hear. No. Oh, right. So you have the NDE because of the DMT. Yeah. So that's what people the normally. Near-death experience because of the dumb and abundant. Okay. I was about to say, yeah, acronyms yeah, yeah, yeah. Aren't, yeah. aren't happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a familiar thing. So when you go to the tunnel, it's because your brain is flooded with this chemical is the idea. It's oh, your brain wow. being having it's a like hallucinatory a, experience. When you die? Yes. Right. Oh. But in all actuality, your body is producing this all the time. Really? Your body just breaks it down super fast. So I'm going to get into it a little bit. Whoa. It's, so DMT is both a derivative and a structural analog of tryptamine, making it similar but slightly different in structure. That's all that means. They're related. Mm -hmm. They're like sisters, but also parents, Cousins. kind of. <laughs> like it's oh. kind of, yeah. So tryptamine is a monamine alkaloid, alkaloid, right? Okay, so it's found in the brains of mammals and is hypothesized to act as a neurotransmitter. This isn't anything new. This is science, mm -hmm. you know? Um, for better context on why that matters, other monoamine, monoamine neurotransmitters include dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. Epinephrine. There's a lot of words that are hard to say here. <laughs> but like dopamine being like your decision making, mm -hmm. serotonin being your happy, and you then epinephrine being like Ooh. your fight or flight, kind okay. of adrenaline, you know? Because of this, certain drugs can be used to increase or reduce those neurotransmitters in the brain. Treating psychiatric and neurological disorders like anxiety or depression or Parkinson's disease. <laughs> the structure of DMT itself occurs within certain important biomolecules like serotonin and melatonin, making it a structural analog of DMT. Some scientists speculate that endogenous DMT is created in the human brain. That just means like natural DMT, I'm pretty sure. In a study in 2011, uh, Nicholas V. Cozy, I don't really know much about this guy, right. but he concluded that INMT, an enzyme present in the biosynthesis of DMT and a lot of other like hallucinogens, is naturally in the primal penile gland as well as the retinal ganglion, neurons, and spinal cord. <laughs> Our listeners are struggling with all I know. this, I'm sure. I know. I mean, there's like the odd biologist. I'm not saying the biologist is odd. Uh, but, you know, there's probably a few guys out there like, oh, yes, the, the adrenal glands. She's and butchering it, but she's right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's promise everyone that we're going to get out of this. Soon. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you can tell, but there's connections and I'm working. I'm working. All right. So the penile gland produces melatonin. Right. OK. So Fair that's enough. that's familiar. OK. It's a hormone related to regulating sleep cycles, but its complete list of functions is actually unknown to us. So we don't really know that much about the penile gland because it did have a lot of primal functions, we think. Oh, this is the one that comes up uh, as potentially occulty. In Rick Strassman's study, DMT, the spirit molecule, he explains his own findings on the penile gland. Not only is it found in other older animals like lizards, lizard brain, <laughs> the human penile gland doesn't develop in the brain, but it actually forms from special tissues on the roof of your mouth as a fetus, and then it later migrates to the center of your brain. What? what? That's yeah. wild. <laughs> so the penile gland shows signs of development within the first 49 days of the fetus's life, the same period of time in which the fetus's gender is first identified normally, or you show like indicators of the gender. <laughs> So, and by no coincidence, Strassman noted that the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead claims that it takes 49 days for the soul of the recently deceased to be reincarnated. So, so that's another reason why people get like occulty and, you know, so your penal soul gland. pops in when it moves to where it's supposed to be. Right on the roof of your mouth and yeah. then you wiggle on up. Yeah, you wiggle on into your spot. <laughs> yep. Hmm. That's what you do. <laughs> so we're gonna get to all my spots. I just <laughs> wiggle on up. in there. Yeah. <laughs> so there, we're gonna move away from the science a little bit, but we're still we're still in the science a little bit. But okay. I'm, it's gonna get a little bit easier to digest. Like those those were cool connections. Those were a little bit, yeah. right? Yeah, like we'll it's proving it. that there's some there's some science to DMT probably. Right. So there are multiple ways of actually taking DMT. You can take it orally, which is like drinking it. 
Um, you can snort it, which I haven't really found much on snorting it yet, but people do it. I haven't, like, found a case. People snort most things. Yeah, uh, rectally, you can apparently, which I'm not sure how that works exactly, so... but, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> you so can... Less common, I think. Yeah. Well, I... okay. <laughs> you can inject it, which I've also never heard of. Okay. Um, you can have it, like, vaporized, which is, like, kind of like smoking it, but... Vaping. Different, yeah. If you want to be like the cool kids. Well, I don't know if you can throw it in your vape pen. <laughs> <laughs> Not with that attitude. <laughs> and right. you can um, also have it through an IV. Oh. oh. So that must be so what interesting. Is it, is it like a leaf? So <laughs> we're going to get into okay. it. There's right, different forms. Just hold on. Everyone's um, very excited. Yes. On the edge of my yes. seat. Jacob can't wait to find out about all this teasing stuff. I know. Now yeah. Shannon's on. You're teasing us mm. too much. We're getting over I have so much info and you all are so just ahead of it. Eager. <laughs> Eager yeah. little Being beavers. So <laughs> I want them wanted to throw in some more ASMR. You just ASMR. ASMR. <laughs> I'll just ASMR the whole thing. <laughs> it can be injected, inhaled, and ingested, but the more popular ways tend to be by smoking it, like my friend did in the beginning. Or by drinking it through a brew called... Coffee. No, <laughs> ayahuasca. Oh, that makes more sense. Yeah. I, you said brewing, and that's, that's about two So options. in your universe, Jacob, everyone's on a little DMT who goes into Starbucks. I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how I explain to people that go to Starbucks. <laughs> Me. <laughs> in order to consume DMT orally... It has to be mixed with an MAOI monamine oxidize, oxidase inhibitor. Okay. Fancy. So it's a MAOI, basically, is what we're going to call it. This may be a term that just sounds foreign to you, right? I don't think you've ever heard of this. Indeed. But they're actually closer to home than you would anticipate. Antidepressants. Oh. Ah. Yeah. I took psychology, so I know what it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's right, <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> MAOIs <laughs> and their opposite, RIMAs, are used to treat major depressive disorder, atypical depression, Parkinson's disease, panic disorder, social phobia. Doctors often use MAOIs as a last chance plan in patients that are resistant to other treatments because SSRIs have become kind of like the more popular treatment for depression nowadays. MAOIs are kind of like the first antidepressant, and then they kind of found a better way of doing it. But some people react better to the MAOIs. Without an MAOI, when you consume DMT orally, your body just quickly metabolizes the DMT, and it won't have that hallucinatory effect that it has to have. So the amount of DMT basically has to be able to exceed the, like, your ability to metabolize. Okay, so, so we're really good at metabolizing it. Yeah, because you produce it naturally. Mm -hmm. So it gets metabolized so fast in your body that your body is just used to doing yeah, this. It makes sense like other like drugs like antidepressants and stuff like that. You right. have to have like a strong enough dose so that way it actually... And it takes some time yeah. a lot of the times to actually like, yeah, be mm -hmm. in your system. So this causes the trip that you have when taking DMT orally to be much longer than when smoked. A brew like ayahuasca having the potential for up to a 16-hour trip. Wow. Yeah. That's a full day. Yep. Whereas vaporizing, injecting, and snorting DMT causes the drug to hit the brain before it can be naturally metabolized, giving you maybe a 5 to probably 15 minute trip. So you either spend a double shift doing a trip, or you do it... No, you don't have to spend 16 hours. For the length of a commercial it depends break on, on how... ABC. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how strong the like ayahuasca is. It depends on the shaman. It and depends probably also on... how much your body can it, handle. Yeah, and it, yeah. it just it entirely depends. A lot of people say the setting None really changes it too. People. I feel like we're all 16 hour people. I don't know. I hide my weight very well. <laughs> I wear That's a lot why of oversized clothes. When they have you take the ayahuasca, <laughs> they'll have you take a certain amount and then you're supposed to add a certain point tell them if you need more or not like you're supposed to like they give you like this I'm allotted sober, dude. thing <laughs> yeah like they're basically I'm, they're I'm, like I'm, are you tripping balls or <laughs> <laughs> so dmt containing plants are typically used in making ayahuasca in a lot of like amazonian like this is what shannon's looking for she practices. wants to know the plants yes oh yes so that's why i'm here the name ayahuasca itself it has like a couple of different translations but 
the one I found the most common is that it means soul vine, which I thought was very oh. interesting. Hmm. Not far from DMT's own nickname, the spirit molecule. Molecule. The main ingredient in ayahuasca is, and get ready for those of you that are into plants, because mm. I'm going to butcher, <laughs> Banisteriopsis copy vine, most known as like the copy vine or cappy vine. That was good. I don't think it was close. <laughs> Said none of the women in the yeah, garden Jacob club. Jacob is shaking yep. his head to the side. He's no. like, mm, it's good, but. <laughs> my, my, my garden club just cringed. Mm. <laughs> they take the vine and they kind of like macerate it. So they like smash it all up and then they um boil it like with a bunch of other plants so the vine is actually the maoi okay uh, so you know i was I telling see. you you need to have that so the vine it actually provides that component the plants that they add are what's going to have the dmt in it oh. this is the same way with vitamins this is why you shouldn't take vitamins because you're supposed to eat the thing that the vitamins are in so if you like take oh. a if you take a vitamin c your body can't process it but if you eat an orange all the stuff that the orange is made of allows your body to process mm. that vitamin C. Yeah, oranges Natural. and DMT are the same. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> the other eating oranges at home. Just... I'm sorry. <laughs> While on DMT. <laughs> yes. The other ingredients tend to differ based on the shaman, what the goal for the ayahuasca is, and often taking into consideration what plants speak to the shaman like himself and the task at hand. So the shaman really does select the plants based off of what they think the person needs but most commonly you're going to see the psychotria viridis which is a leaf or the diplopetarius cabririana which is also a leaf Ooh, not, not, not 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 rihanna rihanna not bad girl riri yeah. Ri. no no uh. <laughs> and mimosa tenuflora which sounds the most pleasant to me. Right, the Garden Club. Jacob's Garden Club has that all the time. Yeah. We do. They have the it's most, a root uh, bark. It's our sp sp yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all going to be... All him and the ladies are chatting. <laughs> yes. They have mimosa something. Mimosa. Ten you Flora. Just holding bark, though. That's it. Yes. Those are all going to be common plants that contain DMT, frequently used in completing ayahuasca, often boiling for hours, sometimes days. It's very, like, ritualized over it. I have a quick question. Yeah. So when you're taking it, are you able to function, like... Depends on how much you take. Okay. So and it also like... depends on if... So... You're probably not running a marathon. No, no. I mean, but, like, are you just, like, kind of, like sitting in a chair and like you, you can, can't really be doing anything you, you can just... do like minimal amounts of like ayahuasca and you can still it's the same thing as like you can trip shrooms and go out in public mm -hmm. i mean a lot of people don't want to like walk down the city streets on shrooms but like <laughs> i've seen some people do it but you though. can yeah i feel like i've seen some in my classes oh yeah I'm sorry yeah. I, I actually watched a shaman in kentucky that uses ayahuasca, but he would give people a very minimal amount. And then he would actually sit down and kind of have like a therapy session with them. And okay. they would end up having this trip, but they were still able to talk and function. And then they would actually like take more later that night and they would have these like, breakthroughs, they would say. Because you're opening yourself up to like this yeah. spiritual connection in a way. And sometimes the therapy, even what they were talking about, would launch them further into their trip. This one woman said that the... She called her Mother M was the figure that she saw that was ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. She said that this woman gave her the memories that she had forgotten, basically. And she, it, it, she it's like, really interesting. Away. Yeah, oh. that she completely blocked out of her memory just like trauma that like was brought back to her as a gift is yeah. what she called it too. This is interesting. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Check one T satisfied. <laughs> yes. Philocybin, which is commonly known as shrooms <laughs> it's also structurally similar to dmt it kind of contains dmt basically and it's used actually in a lot of cancer patients now they've been using it more frequently to treat anxiety in cancer patients because they say um through having this trip where you kind of break through and you see like your birth and you see your death and you see your rebirth you kind of don't fear death anymore so these people come back having no anxiety about dying because they just went through it and they're like, it's going to be okay. Wow. So it's, it's really interesting. Again, like having a near-death experience. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of correlation here. 
Terence McKenna and his brother Dennis specialized in the study of psychedelic mushrooms, finding a way to actually collect spores from the Amazon, which wasn't a thing people were able to do apparently before this time. Well, it's the Amazon. You don't just walk in and walk out. It's well, not apparently like 7-11. It, was, it was the spores. Actually collecting mushroom spores and then transporting them to different regions was uh, very difficult. Well, yeah. Because they would die. Yeah. I was about to say they can't survive. Or get that contaminated. Trip. Yeah. Trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. That's but about time that happened. <laughs> McKenna claimed that five dried grams of shrooms was called the heroic dose, which is the dose that you needed to actually make sure that you had that full experience of loss of ego and like walk away knowing the secrets of the world. But he also said that if you go into the trip thinking that, oh, I might not have taken enough, you definitely did not take enough. So So if you can acknowledge it. Yeah. hmm. Basically, if you're able to like, have that conversation with yourself you're not going to have that that trip you're kind of not like gonna you get would there. know yeah <laughs> or you just wouldn't even be thinking about that as maybe i think Could it also be like a mental block in a way yeah that you're kind of almost w- not willing yourself but kind of willing yourself to not allow yourself to get to that point. there's actually a bunch of instances with mckenna um a lot of his first ayahuasca trips where he didn't actually have that full-fledged trip but he mm-hmm. watched like his wife have it but he didn't actually experience that mm-hmm. I actually know someone that has done up to like five grams of shrooms and has tripped balls, but did not see machine elves, so. You can go up the mountain, but that doesn't mean the old man's waiting for you. Nope. <laughs> now, uh, we're coming back to a teaser. Another, uh, another, oh another tease gosh. answered. Oh, man. Lit- right. yeah. Shannon, you'd be responsible for No, 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 no. I'm, Jacob I'm answering the tease. What am I the supposed tease to do with it? Answer the tease. The tease. I'm, I'm answering oh, it, Oh, good. Guys. Which I'm, tease? Uh, I'm bringing you tease relief, well, then, okay? Is it a tease? No, I'm bringing you the relief is what I said. Tea's relief. From the tea. This is what we want. <laughs> All I heard was tea leaves, but okay. Now, I need to talk about space shrooms for a minute. <gasps> Yay, finally. Yeah, yeah. Back to space. space. It's time. Biophysicist Francis Crick developed a theory called panspermia. Does it sound familiar? No. Well, you might be able to figure it out based off the name. But the idea is that life exists on other planets through the distribution of things like space dust, asteroids, meteorites, spacecraft carrying microorganisms from other planets, you know, etc. McKenna takes this theory a step further, hypothesizing that mushrooms may be creatures of high intelligence, migrating to our planet through spores carried from space, attempting to reconnect with us in our symbiotic relationship with plants. That's There's so, so sad. many movies and stuff about zombies that are infected by mushroom spores, so it could make sense. So, so they're living things. <laughs> so because there are fictional movies about it, yeah, it could make sense. Gotta come from somewhere, some source, you know. Our lives are just fictional stories that we're constantly making up. Well, that is oh. true. So Whoa. the answer is yes. <laughs> I accept that. I need a minute. <laughs> I have spoken about extraterrestrial contact and the relationship to the psilocybin mushrooms. I have mentioned that psilocin, which is what psilocybin quickly becomes as it enters your metabolism, is 4-hydroxy-dimethyltryptamine. It is only 4-substituted indole in all of organic nature. Let this rattle around in your mind for a moment. It is the only for substituted indole known to exist on Earth. It happens to be the psychedelic substance that occurs in about 80 species of fungi, most of which are native to the New World. Psilocybin has a unique chemical signature that says, I am artificial. I come from outside. I was suggesting that it was a gene, an artificial gene, carried perhaps by a space-born virus or something brought artificially to this planet in that this gene has insinuated itself into the genome of these mushrooms. McKenna explains that while DMT combines visual and audio experiences, psilocybin speaks. That's the word he always uses, is it speaks. He says he doesn't always take what the mushrooms tell him seriously, but rather he shares a dialogue with it, is the way that he words it. So it's still like a helpful conversation. In the syntax of psychedelic times, McKenna quotes from a straight transcription of the mushroom themselves. I am old. Older than thought in your species, which is itself 50 times older than your history. Though I have been on earth for ages, I am 
from the stars. My home is no one planet, for many worlds scattered through the shining disk of the galaxy have conditions which allow my spores an opportunity for life. The mushroom which you see is the part of my body given to sex thrills and sunbathing. My true body is a fine network of fibers growing through the soil. These networks may cover acres and may have far more connections than the number in a human brain. McKenna once asked the mushroom what they were doing on Earth, and the mushroom replied, Listen, if you're a mushroom, you live cheap. Besides, I'm telling you, this was a very nice neighborhood until the monkeys got out of control. The monkeys are a term that the mushrooms, apparently, according to McKenna, actually use to describe us. I assume. Oh. So people are monkeys. I kind of put that one together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Other honorable uh, mentions for bits of shroom wisdom. Ooh, shroom wisdom. Yes. Shroom this should be wisdom. a part of our segment all the time, <laughs> honestly. Uh, now, the first in our ongoing series, mm-hmm. Shroom Wisdom, yes. featuring Olivia. If you don't have a plan, you become part of someone else's plan. That's true. That's how oh. all of you ended up on my podcast. That is true. Yeah. We, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nature loves courage. Mm. How poetic. Nice Nobody knows jack shit about what's going on. So true. Yep. So Amen. true. Someone once asked McKenna to ask the mushroom how to save the earth. And when they did, without a moment's hesitation, the mushroom replied, each person should only parent once. And I think there's something profound about oh, that. Wow. Wow. Well, check. So far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've parented once, but the mushroom would have me stop. Yeah, he said no more. Overpopulation. Yeah. Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> yes. I will not parent. <laughs> <laughs> A lesser accepted theory of McKenna's, which he does accept, I think, to a certain degree, is more of like a what if than a actual like he 100% believes this that's kind of the thing about McKenna is some stuff he's kind of like he's more saying this is a possibility let's think about it you know instead of just closing your mind off to the possibility so the theory I'm going to talk about is called the stoned ape theory (laughs) yep check number three tease number three yes McKenna theorizes that in low doses, shrooms increases your visual capabilities, particularly your edge detection. So, like, your edge detection. What's around you? Your peripheral vision. Yes. Oh, okay. Your so your, your spatial vision. awareness. <laughs> okay. Your yeah. <laughs> okay. So that makes for better hunters, less getting killed, right? In higher doses, it increases sexual arousal and a breaking down of personal boundaries. Oh. Basically. Tripping encourages orgies, which encouraged both mass reproduction and a more diverse wow. mixing of DNA, both beneficial to the caveman. Uh, and there's some so, drugs that do that. <laughs> like shrooms. <laughs> or poppers. Well, we, we didn't have those. <laughs> well, sorry. What an education we're giving our listeners today. <laughs> Oops. It caused people to work out their problems as a group, much like with the shamanic cultures that you talk about in your episode. Right. McKenna also thinks that this helped form language and the forming of signals and, like, how we process them, like, in our language. So, part two, unless there's any questions about that. I just want to clarify that stoned ape theory then refers to the fact that apes were stoned for a while so that they could have orgies. people were somewhat, like... (laughs) Basically, these ancient, like, groups were eating the shrooms or eating, like, not even necessarily realizing, like, taking them, being like, oh, I'm gonna trip. It just, like, was. And they were in either such low or high doses that it might have caused us to do different evolutionary things that we might not have done otherwise, is kind of what he suggests. Like, spread our spermatozoa. Well, like, it helped, yeah. I think that's a plant thing. Oh, I was about to say. I was going back to the panspermia. Oh, Mm. pan or spermia? Panspermia. Panned our spermia all over the place. Yep. (laughs) Thanks, ayahuasca. (laughs) (laughs) Can that be our new catchphrase? (laughs) Thanks, ayahuasca. (laughs) It's gonna be mine, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) So, part two. Machine elves. We're doing it. We're getting there. So machine elves, also known as jesters, fractal elves, or self-transforming machine elves, 
are nearly inconceivable entities that McKenna claims that he encountered while deep in DMT hyperspace, is what he calls it. Hmm. McKenna first encountered the Machine Elves while he was attending Berkeley College as an art history major, actually, in 1965, beginning his lifelong quest to discover the truth about the fractal beings. McKenna has been praised for his ability to describe this indescribable experiences while in psychedelics, particularly DMT, inspiring a trend of artist renderings of machine elves that you can probably just spend hours going through on Google. Like they're these crazy technicolor pictures of these geometric shapes and like beings. Do and they look kind of similar? They do. They all have this like almost kaleidoscope look. If Ooh. that makes sense the, to me. Let's pop a link up maybe on the website. Yeah, I'll, I'll, check we'll find some. There's so many. However, McKenna claims that any description he gives is so far from accurate that it's essentially a lie. A classic, you have to see it to believe it scenario. Yeah, like most things in the paranormal. Yeah. yeah. His attempts at explaining his visions are full of poetic, alien whimsy that's both intriguing and a little bit unsettling sometimes. That's lovely. Lovely turn of phrase there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Alien whimsy. Yeah, I That's like what that. Did it for you? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of entities waiting on the other side, saying, "How wonderful that you're here! You come so rarely. We're so delighted to see you." They're like jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs, and there are many of them, and they come pounding toward you, and they will stop in front of you and vibrate, but then they do a very disconcerting thing, which is they jump into your body, and then they jump back out again. And the whole thing is going on in a high-speed mode where you're being presented with thousands of details per second and you can't get a hold on them. And these things are saying, don't give in to astonishment. Which is, which is exactly what you want to do. You want to go nuts with how crazy this is. And they say, don't do that. Pay attention to what we are doing. What they're doing is making objects with their voices, singing structures into existence. They offer things to you saying, look at this, look at this, and it's... As your attention goes towards these objects, you realize what you're being shown is impossible. It's not simply intricate, beautiful, or hard to manufacture. It's impossible to make these things. The nearest analogy would be the Fabergé eggs. But these things are like the toys that are scattered around the nursery inside a UFO. Celestial toys. And the toys themselves appear to be somehow alive and can sing other objects into existence. McKenna attempted to explain images that he said just defied English and redefined language as we know it. They communicated without words, but in a kind of, almost like a telepathic song is kind of the best way I can Whoa. kind of put it. <laughs> he describes bursting through a chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum. Chrysan Thank you. Chrysanthemum. They're very beautiful. Yeah. Flowers. It's a garden club. They do those all the time. <laughs> That's true. Jacob mm -hmm. and the ladies. Yep. <laughs> he describes bursting through one, a technicolor mandala, and enter a dome-shaped underground space, the home of the machine elves. It's mechanical and bright and pulsating with energy. Hence machine. Yes. <laughs> oh, I was kind of wondering where a machine got into the mix. So they live in a big machine dome. Yeah. McKenna? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But that is not what immediately arrests my attention. What arrests my attention is the fact that this space is uninhabited. That the immediate impression as you break into it is that there's a cheer. You break into this space and are immediately swarmed by squeaking, self-transforming elf machines made of light and grammar and sound that come chirping and squealing and tumbling toward you and they say, Hooray! Welcome! You're here, and in my case, you send so many, and you come so rarely. Many people who have experienced a DMT trip describe visions very similar to McKenna. Joe Rogan, like we talked about earlier, famously talks about the Jester-esque figure that flipped him off during the bad trip. He mm. says that this Jester was like taunting him the whole time, and it was just flipping him off and saying, like, F you, F you, F you. Which sounds bizarre when you compare it to, like, McKenna's descriptions. A little bit. But honestly, the way that McKenna describes it is a much more polite version of that. So they still are very, like, people will say they're very annoying sometimes. They're too bubbly. They're too in your face. It's like an overriding. Sometimes they get really fed up with you and they're like, oh, like, you're not understanding. And they just, like, cast you off. So it does fit with McKenna, but in a very Joe Rogan kind of way. Like, that's what his consciousness would have perceived. 
But if everybody perceives them in a different way, then how we know that they're all the same beings and not different beings? Like maybe... So we don't really, technically. But there's just a lot of similarities and a lot of... It, it, what's hard about it is we haven't experienced the DMT trip. So we do not have the ability, according to McKenna, to even possibly like... Our brains can't wrap around what it would be. It barely can wrap around it in the moment. Your brain has to catch up kind of later. I'm going to actually literally about to get to it, oh, but cool. some people like in um, Rick Strassman's experiment, and a lot of people said that they saw angels or demons or people will say they see biblical creatures or they'll just think that it's some like overarching God. Like how I was talking about the Kentucky shaman earlier, mm -hmm. his version of this figure is called, they call him Mother M is what they he calls it. So like everyone kind of has their own thing, but they all carry this very similar vibe of a presence even if the dialogue is different and to get to the machine elves i think you you do have to do a considerable amount like you that's like you are breaking through a barrier like that breaking through that mandala like breaking through to that other side down into the machine dome yeah yeah so yes. <laughs> <laughs> so other people like i said they don't necessarily experience elves you know but they will see like all these other creatures from 1990 to 1995, Rick Strassman underwent a study on the effects of DMT, which all of the colleagues in his field told him not to do as a psychologist. This was like, and, and this is partially, you know, Nixon, anti-drug, like, that inspired this. But all the people in his field were like, why do you want to study this? There's no point. But, you know, he, he actually had to get someone to make, his, another scientist friend, to make the DMT for him because he couldn't actually get it into the United States. So hmm. um, there were 60 test subjects from all different generations and lifestyles, a mix of people with previous experience with psychedelics and then a lot of people who only decided to try psychedelics for the first time because it was in a hospital setting. So they were like, oh, well, I can't die here, <laughs> basically. Which, honestly... I mean, if you were to undergo a trip, I feel like you'd be the most safe in a hospital. Like, you'd feel the most safe in a way because, you know, you'd know nothing could ha You couldn't die. They wouldn't let you die, <laughs> like, in a hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Each had different yet shared experiences, all featuring some sort of overarching godhead figure. All right, if I could just step in here, Olivia, and uh, wrap yep, this yep, up. Yep, I'll uh, move right out of the way. There you go. Wrap this, wrap this on up. Uh, to put McKenna in context a bit, he played a pioneering countercultural role, and we can compare him to Timothy Leary. Mm. Uh, Timothy Leary, of course, famous for his LSD work and experiments. Um, but McKenna, as well, championed the cause of what we might call the psychonauts, or to break down the uh, Greek there, the mind sailors. The psychonauts? Psychonauts. Sailors of the mind. Like, astronaut oh. is a sailor of the space. The Astros. Oh. McKenna's famous aphorism, culture is not your friend, echoes Leary's turn on, tune in, drop out. He believed that society had grown very, very sick, driven to its illness by unquestioned rationalism and a regular enemy of ours here on Occult Confessions, a culture of masculinity, also kind of a target in the Lady <laughs> Magic series. Um, and uh, focus on what he called the surface of things. So not dropping below the, the through the veil, beyond the veil, much as we do every, every day here on Occult Confessions. Or twice a month. Yeah. <laughs> not every day. <laughs> He, it's a lot of work. Yes, it is. It is. Getting under that veil is uh, it's a lot you gotta of work. Gotta lift it up. And... Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> he... <laughs> he advocated for an archaic revival, as Olivia <gasps> said uh, in her, her sources there, that would return humanity. Beautiful. It was reviving. To an earlier, more egalitarian, more spiritual state of being, like our apes who are stoned. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> drugs, he said, were a mechanism. Well, it was at least a fantasy. So okay. drugs were a mechanism for facilitating this mass social healing exercise. We're coming around to our spiritual healing. We have come to live, he believed, in a dominator culture in which men dominate women, the rich dominate the poor, mm. and everyone is in a constant struggle to attain the top spot. 
The ego dissolution precipitated by psychedelic drugs was the cure for this ego-driven quest for dominance. They could open up a window for people to feel their connection to the planet and to each other, ending humans' abuse of the environment and each other. But our dominator culture is not going to go down easy. Olivia mentioned the War on Drugs, first inaugurated by Richard Nixon in 1971. You'll know shortly after the rise of the counterculture in the 60s and sort of the blossoming of the New Age and all the sorts of things we get into here. This has been, in part, a war against McKenna's psychonauts. Technically, drug use for religious purposes is legally protected, but as the scholar Andrew Monteith argues, Psychonauts, while somewhat organized online, do not have the sorts of formal institutions or rituals that would tend to shield them from prosecution. So there's your warning. Mm. <laughs> do not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as marijuana use is gradually legalized across North America, though, the next phase in the conflict between dominators and psychonauts should be unfolding very soon. Until then, the alchemical actors will stick with podcasting as our safest means for exploring the far limits of consciousness. We must go back to the plants. The plants have the answers. We must reconvene yes. with the plants. We must mm -hmm. reconnect our symbiotic relationship so that we can talk to elves as we trip. Yes. All the time and learn the secrets and not be afraid to die. Your eyes are so wide right now. I am on DMT right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was something I was like, is it like, I, I'm assuming no, but how often is like a DMT like a positive experience? Is it always positive or is it just hit or miss? No or? drug is going to always be positive. Hmm. So, but I mean, even when I, so there were some cases of some pretty, pretty bad trip. So there was this one guy actually during Strassman's experiments, I believe, that he had this terrible trip, but the only part that I remember that he described was that he was basically being an like anally raped by a crocodile. Ooh. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, and uh. it was like this, but a, the probing thing is something that happens in a lot of bad trips, apparently. So there will be this probing component and it changes depending on what it is but that kind of goes with alien lore say, could it be like some kind of like a subconscious thing that like we kind it of could be this thing about with well some people probing? yeah some people think the machine elves are actual aliens oh. you know that we're talking to and they sense some they're... people think that they're ancestral spirits that are warning us some people think they're us but in the future Okay, we're going to forego our order of confessors for this episode and the next one. Uh, we are anxious to collect those positive reviews that I'm sure you're leaving for us. Please give give all the positive, all the positivity. Loving it's and the uh, the A, the A, plus. a pluses, yeah. Yes. So, uh, but uh, we're we're going to be away on vacation for this month, so we've pre-recorded both uh, this episode and the Jesus episode, so uh, we are unable to give you uh, real time responses to your queries yeah. but uh, we look forward to addressing all of them in, in our demonology episode we'll still see them yes yeah. we will be seeing we'll them, and, them and, and we'll be responding yeah. to them we'll be on our, our social medias because we never put our social medias down not even for on vacation, vacation. Yeah. not even on vacation well shannon's watching my house while i'm gone so and your dog she'll keep she can and your plants and she can also oh, watch the social talk medias to them. Talk to the plants. See, Don't see smoke them, because they they might not have DMT in there. No, probably not, because it's just like cucumbers and tomatoes and. and uh... I'll have to check. Doesn't hurt I'll to get try. Back to you. <laughs> There's some mint. Oh. <laughs> All right, I hereby adjourn and declare closed this meeting of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors. But wouldn't that be Olivia's job? No, we because we flipped. We flipped. We flipped back. I am the. Did you I miss am the, the captain now. <laughs> oh no, you're right. She. <laughs> Shannon's been doing this whole episode. I think she just realized that we flipped roles. I also I, gave Shannon DMT. I also, <laughs> I, also I, had I flipped you all DMT. Three white claws this whole time. I'm wearing like my white suburban mother outfit. It's my romper with like butterflies. And my hair's up. I even brought pizza for 
Mm -hmm. Good mom. She did. Yeah. She's a very good mom. I thought you were bringing pastries she when you said, said white cloth. She said no claw, one said but... thank you, so I have to get them to say thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. While we're away on vacation, feel free to hop on Instagram and send Shannon your thanks. Yeah, for holding, right in the holding us together. Until such a time as we get together and do it again. How about that? Ah, I didn't miss a beat. Was that a statement towards me? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> so, uh, joining us... Uh, oh, Olivia does this. Go ahead, your turn. Your turn. Ha! Well, let me do this part. Joining us today, <laughs> uh, at least occasionally, you may or may not have heard her, is my child, Corinne, because we've been recording in the upstairs of the house. Yeah. Now, Olivia, you take over. So for voices today, we had James Caplanges playing McKenna. Delightful. And then we also had um, a guy you named Rob Thompson voicing the shrew. Never heard of him. Sounds like a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then today in our little circle, we've got Shannon. Bye, guys. Jacob. Or ladies. Yeah. People, all everybody, them. all of them. Yes. Friends. <gasps> Hi, friends. Aw. Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> Rob. We'll be getting things back to normal next episode to discuss Jesus colon worker of miracles. That's a unique way to say bye. But <laughs> and I'm Olivia. Don't do DMT at home. Don't try to make ayahuasca. It's going to go bad. That's good advice. I but go to the Amazons if you can. Maybe. Oh. I don't... It's it's a little <laughs> bit political over there, the state of commercial shamanism, so maybe don't. Don't get the malaria or any of that, though. Yeah, don't get... Get a, <laughs> get a net. My get a... Oh, well, Jacob's <laughs> leaving. Net. I'm literally right now. <laughs> yeah? I have to go. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Just a quick note in closing, you can hear me on the podcast Magic and Mediums having a conversation with a lovely host, Anya Reed, about government psychics. Uh, you, you may notice, I think as a result of the uh, uh, recording uh, via the internet, that I am a bit higher pitched than usual, but my thoughts are still under that higher pitched voice. Uh, we want to thank Jenica, listener Jenica and patron, for making that connection for us with Magic and Mediums. And we also want to give a shout out to Cast Crisp, uh, who inspired today's episode.